It's Atlanta's number one hip-hop station, Hot 107.9 and home for the Ricky Smiley Morning Show. Of course, you know it's your boy, B-High, radio shouting, stepping in the building right now. I have a doctor, an author, financial advisor, business owner, and web host, Dr. Boyce Watkins. What's good with it, boss? Oh, not much, brother. How you doing today, man? I mean, I'm feeling good, feeling great right now, man. I'm ready to uh, get into this all-black national convention, though, doctor. Yeah, man. Yeah, we 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 pulling everything together, trying mm-hmm. to have a real black conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, I use the words all black just to make a very clear point. You ain't got to be black to be there, but everything that we talk about, the whole agenda from start to finish, mm-hmm. is black, 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 black. Uh, you know, it's not like the Democratic National Convention where they might mention black folks for like three seconds. Exactly. You know, the Republican National Convention, you know, where they don't mention black people at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted something that clearly had the word black in it. That's right. Uh, and we use the word all to double sort of makes a double impact mm-hmm. and uh it's going really really well man people are really excited i mean what topics are we touching in this convention uh, a lot of topics mm-hmm. uh, everything from uh the, the uh, struggles with the educational mm-hmm. system uh police brutality uh the issue with intergenerational wealth we're going to show the film resurrecting black wall street have a conversation on what it takes to build a black wall street in your family and in your community we got wealth experts coming in from all over the world we also have uh, conversations on black men, mm-hmm. uh, sort of re, re, rebuilding the image of the black man, man in America. Mm-hmm. We're actually launching Black Men United, our advocacy group for black men. Uh, so it's a strong panel. Uh, we got different brothers from different perspectives, from uh, David Banner and, and Killer Mike to guys like Dr. Roosevelt Mitchell III, Yurima Karama, et cetera, who are going, you know, and also, in fact, um, there's a brother named Ken Williams, who's a former police detective, uh, who's going to talk about police brutality. And so just lots of experts, man, that just, mm-hmm. um, you know, are going to create something that I think is going to be just beautiful. Now, what is it that made you go ahead and decide to do the convention to begin with? I don't know, man. It came kind of like a flash of inspiration, to be honest with you. I mean, we have been doing events all over the country. We went, we've probably gone to maybe 25 cities like this year. Yeah. And it was like, I just said, you know, we need to do something really special. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just thought about it. Let's do a convention. Let's let's call it the All Black National Convention. And it was almost like you're sort of moving on faith mm-hmm. because a lot of times to do things at that scale, you have to have corporate sponsorship yeah. and just big money. And we didn't really have the resources. We had got kind of wiped, we wiped ourselves out in making these movies that we had been making because yeah. we're trying to make, you know, create a film industry as well. But I just felt the spirit, man. And one thing I know about doing things that are bigger than yourself is that you're usually never going to feel ready, mm. you know. And uh, also what happens is you'll you surprise yourself. You put the pressure on yourself. Yeah. You just go hard and you have faith. Mm. And next thing you know, things kind of unfold. Mm. And so I've, I've grown through this, man. Mm. I mean, I really didn't know exactly how it was going to turn out, but the support's been amazing. Mm. And now we're starting to hear from all these people around the world who are excited just like we are. Mm. How do you feel when you look up and you see your people helping to finance what's going on through group uh, group economics? I think it's incredibly important because black people have to realize that we are not economically and psychologically handicapped. You know, uh, we have been brainwashed to believe that we are a charity case, Mm -hmm. that we don't have the capacity to educate our own children, Mm -hmm. that we don't have the ability to create our own jobs, that we don't have the ability to do anything by ourselves without somebody coming along and saving us. And, and to understand how racial equality, or inequality works, um, think about how many things that white people do for themselves on a regular basis that we just don't believe we have the ability to do on our own. Mm-hmm. And I think that's wrong. Um, and so maybe with this uh, particular convention, this is there's no corporate sponsorship. Money ain't coming from outside the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the bulk of everything comes from uh, two companies I'm a part owner in. One is the BlackBusinessSchool.com, mm-hmm. where we got 30,000 students, uh, mostly black, who are learning business and economics and everything else and how to start companies and all this other stuff. And basically the revenue from that is what's being used to finance all of this. And then also greatblackspeakers.com, which is a company. My brother owns it, but I own a percentage of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's the largest black-owned speakers bureau in the country. Mm-hmm. And from the very beginning, when I first began my career as a public scholar, when I left the corporate plantation at uh, Syracuse University, mm-hmm. uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to say, okay, I, I know who my heroes are. My heroes were uh, Cornell West, Michael Eric Dyson, Julianne Malvo, Louis Farrakhan, at that point Al Sharpton. We, we don't really talk to each other as much, the Jesse Jacksons, et cetera. And so I felt, I felt, that the next step in our evolution as a community would be, and again, at this at that point, it was a pipe dream. I mean, wasn't nobody really checking for Boyce Watkins at that time at all. Um, and uh, and I said, but the next step would be for us to develop these platforms and spaces for, for ideas to be shared, but to sort of have it uh, structured in a more independent way, in a mm-hmm. sovereign way, right? Because think about this. Most of the time throughout history, 
when a black person got out of line and said things that the majority of America didn't want to hear, first thing they do is they take your platform to take away your money, maybe ruin your reputation, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because that show you're on is owned by a network owned by somebody else. Those books you're writing, the publishing company is owned by somebody else. That record deal you got, the record label, you know, I mean, I could go on and on and on, right? You're giving speeches over the speakers' bureaus controlled by somebody else. So when you become kind of their, their least favorite Negro, mm -hmm. they're going to they're gonna castrate you and throw you out the window and replace you with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we tried to structure our organization. It was tough, but we structured from the ground up mm -hmm. to be uh, protected mm -hmm. against that kind of backlash. And what it does is it translates into a kind of freedom of speech mm -hmm. that I think is pretty unique. I'm not really scared of anybody when I do what I do. I'm not scared to say nothing about anything. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm still going to have that three, four, five million people a week that we reach online. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, speaking of another beautiful thing, uh, financial love making 101. Yes. Break that down to me. Because, see, one thing that I've <laughs> noticed with my brothers and sisters, if they come together in a union, okay, it's already hard enough to get us to come together in a union, okay? We get them together, but they come in and they say, I came with this, you came with that, and I don't want to hear nothing else. How do we get them to bring that together? You know what? Um it's funny, what you just said sparked a lot of thoughts, and I'll, I'll try to uh, spit them out one by one so I don't mm -hmm. sound crazy. But first thing is, you know, there's two things we tend to think about a lot in adulthood. Mm -hmm. It's money and sex. Mm -hmm. Every day we think about one of those two things, or both of them, probably several times a day. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people that say that they don't, they, they lying, right? Uh, so, you know, and it's interesting that given that those are two things you think about the most in adulthood, it's ironic that these are the two things that most families never discuss in the household, mm. right? You know, you talk to your mom or your daddy about sex, the conversation is, well, well, just don't do it. I mean, that, that ain't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and just save your money. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you, right. We've been, you know, human beings have existed for millions of years. Uh, people going to always be having sex, right? Uh, and so same thing with money. You know, money becomes uh, just such a powerful force in the lives of all of us that it's crazy that we would go into a capitalist society where money moves the whole society uh -huh. and you don't understand nothing about money. It's a lot like being thrown into the NBA and you would never dribble the basketball. You don't even know which basket to put the ball in, Ooh. right? And so that's where a lot of us are. So when I thought about how to teach money, you know, see, just money by itself, just worshiping money and all that, that always bored me. I was never interested in, in that. Mm -hmm. But I was intrigued by the power of money and the way it shapes people's lives, the way it shapes us as human beings. Mm -hmm. So... I, I, as I would look for creative ways to talk about money, I realized that money can easily be linked to things that we understand from birth. Mm -hmm. Things like love and sex and relationships, mm -hmm. right? You ain't got to teach nobody how to have sex. Yeah. You know what I mean? They figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You ain't got to teach them how to fall in love. Yeah. It just happens. And what's ironic, what's very interesting is that there are an infinite number of ways I can show you how uh, the way you see money, uh, the way you do business, the way we uh, choose to buy black or not buy black, all of that links back mm -hmm. to the universal language of love. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you understand love, then you can understand investing. You can understand risk return. You can understand all of that. So financial lovemaking was just kind of like a fun little exercise. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so a lot of couples will read it to talk about how they can merge because that's the thing. Black people, unfortunately, because we're, so many of us are traumatized and have that distrust we have a hard time loving each other. Mm -hmm. And the way a love relationship works is the same way an economy works. Mm -hmm. uh, when you don't have trust, then you don't have exchange, mm -hmm. right? Like if, if you if you get a, get a business and, and I'm a consumer and I don't trust you, I'm not going to give you my money, mm -hmm. right? Or if you're a business and you don't trust me as a customer, then you're not going to treat me. You, you're going to treat me in a way that's, that's not going to make anything good come out of that relationship, exactly. right? You, you know, in fact, you have a lot of black business owners who say, oh, I don't sell nothing to black people because black people, they always asking for the hookup. They ain't never got yeah. no money. They don't never pay on time. Right. That lack of trust. Right. Well, that same lack of trust that we have that keeps us from buying black mm. is the same lack of trust that we have that keeps us from maintaining our marriages. Mm. It's the same lack of trust that causes so many of these young ladies, unfortunately, to have a baby and the daddy's gone before the baby even turns one month old you know i you mean think about it you know what i'm talking and i'm not dissing it it's just real we mm -hmm. see it right yeah, like like how what the hell has to be happening that y'all get together make a baby and the, and the dad and the, the family split up before the baby even comes to this planet and you know, one first of the things breath. i always say the kids didn't ask to be here and uh you figured out how to love somebody for them few minutes that y'all was getting it on so y'all better figure it out when it comes to raising this child Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it is crazy. I mean, that, and, and, and I mean, I, the obvious thing is that that's not that's really not love. Right. Exactly. That's that's something else. It's lust. It's attraction. It's 
all of that. Exactly. It's it's instant gratification. It's I want this because it's going to feel good, mm-hmm. right? To me, love is something that's much um, stronger, subtler. Requires more discipline, more commitment. Me love me really loving somebody, especially if I'm traumatized and I'm hurt. Me loving somebody requires a lot of discipline. I got to fight through some walls. I got to fight through my walls yep. and then your walls. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And so, yeah. so really, if you think about it, the ability of a black man to love a black woman requires him to have a deep-seated commitment to the black woman mm-hmm. because the black woman's been through so much. In fact, for many black women, the first man she ever loved, her father, was not there for whatever reason. And so she, she's bringing that kind of those issues into the relationships that she may not even know are there. And a man has to really love her to fight through all of that. And the same thing is true. We know a lot of brothers out here are crazy because of what we go through as black men. <laughs> you know, so black people loving each other requires a lot of work. So to me, that same love language must translate into an economic language. In order for a black consumer and a black business to love each other enough to want to support each other, you got to fight through some stuff. You're going to deal with some black businesses that might that might disappoint you. That's right. You know, that might not have the service you want, that may right. not have the prices you want. But if you really love yeah, your community, man. you know what I mean? If you're not just sort of in it because you're looking for the cheapest price all the time, you, then you're going to stick with it. You know, one black business lets you down, you go find another one. You know, so so it, it's all it's all the same thing. Another question, how easy is it to really invest? Because a lot of times we all see lump sums of cash. But we just don't know where to put it, okay? I, you don't trust the <laughs> bank. You don't trust yourself. You just say, you know what? Let me just put the money out of sight and out of mind, and I'll come back to it. And hopefully, it's magically grown somehow. <laughs> How can we get into the business of investing our money and watching it grow? At theblackbusinessschool.com, mm-hmm. which people can actually join for free initially, mm-hmm. uh, we send them a video immediately on how to buy your first share of stock in, in 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we do, the reason we do that is because we want the stock market to stop being scary to people. You know, there's no whites only sign on the stock market. You ain't got to be a millionaire to be in the stock market. You ain't got to have a Ph.D. in finance to invest in the stock market. When you look at the gap in wealth Mm -hmm. between the rich and the middle class and the poor, Mm -hmm. most of that gap can be explained by one major factor, and that is stock market participation. Mm -hmm. You see, your money is not you ask a four year old, like, what is money? A four year old will say something like a money is what I use to buy stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. I can go buy candy with that. Right. But then you go up 20 years, that same person might still think that that's what money is, Mm -hmm. that money's just used to buy stuff. And that's what they call consumption. Mm -hmm. Money's not supposed to be used all the time for consumption. Money is capital. Mm -hmm. Capital is supposed to grow. Capital is supposed to make you more money. It's like if I got a bushel of apples and all I see is how good I'm going to eat in the Mm -hmm. next 10 minutes, I'm missing the point. The the value's in the seeds. Right. And, you know, so so long story short, you know, when it comes to investing, first and foremost, I I encourage people to just take the baby steps to start getting into the stock market. Mm -hmm. They think that it's about picking the right stock at the right time and, Mm -hmm. you know, and trading back and forth like the stock market's a casino. It ain't none of that. No, really. uh, And I've studied all this. My whole Mm -hmm. dissertation was on the stock market. I know I studied the data, the history, all of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you like this. Look, basically like this. If somebody wants to get started in the stock market, all they got to do is take about $100 a month mm-hmm. and and invest $100 a month in the market. Buy, just pick any stock. doesn't matter what stock you pick. Just randomly pick stocks, do $100 a month, and keep educating yourself over time. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee you, in 20, 30 years, you're going to have money. You're going to have a lot of money. And, the, and, and so some people may say, well, 30 years, I don't want to wait that long. Mm-hmm. But if you got a newborn baby, I mean, think about this. You do that for your child from the time they're born. And by the time they're 30, they got hundreds of thousands, if not over a million dollars available in the market. That's a game changer for them. They can make different life choices than you made. They're not going to have to go in debt to go to school. They're not going to have to go in debt to buy a house. Mm-hmm. They're not going to have to go in debt to go buy, to get married. You know what? They're going to be able to quit their job and start a business and, and get the money without it being a big deal. And so the biggest thing about wealth building that I think a lot of people forget mm-hmm. is – that wealth building, if you look at most wealthy families throughout the history of the world, most wealthy families accumulate their wealth over many decades, many generations. Wealth building is not a, it's a, a sprint. It's not a sprint. Mm-hmm. It is a marathon and it's a relay race. It's something where you run as fast as you can. You hand the baton off to your kids and make sure they're in a better position than you were. I'm glad you said that, doctor, because when we think about wealth and trying to have money as black people, We want what LeBron has. We want Mm -hmm. what Jay-Z and Beyonce has because those are the images that we see in our faces on a daily basis. And we say, you know what, I need $100 I need half a billion. I need to be knocking on a billion myself. So let's let's talk realistically speaking. If you're trying to come out of the hood 
and you want to make sure that your child is living good, what is the steps that they need to take with their tax return? February. Okay, it's funny, but well, actually, I, I had to start with what you were saying yeah. about LeBron and all that, mm-hmm. man. I was talking to the the brother who was on a different world who played Dwayne Wayne's uh, friend Ron. Uh huh. It's funny, man, because he said something that I thought was real cool. He said he said people don't understand that that eighty percent of the wealth in this world has been uh, the last two years was created in Silicon Valley in technology. That literally, if we were as committed to technology as we are to basketball and singing and dancing and rapping and balling and all this other stuff, we could take over a sector that literally is, is where money is just being printed every day. You know, you can't afford to buy a house in Silicon Valley because there's so much money out there, right? And so basically, you know, if you talk about, you know, where the money's at, mm-hmm. the money's not in entertainment. Most entertainers I know, you know a lot of entertainers yeah. too. You know the real story. A lot of these entertainers are not, are not doing very well. Mm-hmm. They they are they are this close to being homeless and they're trying to maintain an illusion for the public, you know, fake it yeah. till you make it, you yeah. know. So so you know, basically, what I would say with our kids is we got to just realize like where the money's at. Mark Zuckerberg, who created Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg makes more money in a month than LeBron James will make in his whole entire life. He makes a billion dollars a month from a business he created while he was in college. He started Facebook when he was nineteen. In college, everybody else is going out, getting turned up. He was sitting in front of the computer, pecking away, Loaded. building a business, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, we got to really think about where the money's at. But to your point, to what you were saying specifically, mm-hmm. what somebody could do right now with their tax return, um, I would say, number one, you you have to have like a cushion of savings somewhere. Have some something that's, that's, that can be easily turned into cash mm-hmm. because your money can, you save your money so your money can save you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you may do that by putting your money, if, if, even if you put it in the stock market, mm-hmm. The stock market is liquid. Liquid means that it can easily be turned into cash. If you need the money tomorrow, you sell the stock and you got the cash. Mm-hmm. But so, so I would go to the stock market, man, because you know, like the last since Obama got elected, I'm gonna tell you like this, just being real. Mm-hmm. Obama's policies, most of his policies, did not help black people. They, they, they really didn't. Mm-hmm. But one thing that he did was he helped the stock market a lot. When that, when they spent all that money recovering from the crash in 08, that money went straight to the bank, straight to the stock market. Mm-hmm. Anybody who was in the stock market made a lot of money when the recovery took place. Yep. Even even small investors in the stock market. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, if I got, you know, let's say $1,000 for my refund, mm-hmm. I go to, you know, Ameritrade somewhere else, mm-hmm. get a little account, start buying some shares of stock. Mm-hmm. It does not matter really what stocks you pick. It ain't about picking the right stock at the right time. They did a study. I, I'll tell you why it doesn't matter. Look, they did a study where they have monkeys picking stocks with, <laughs> by throwing darts at a wall. And so when, you know, wherever the stock, wherever the dart landed, if it landed on IBM, they bought IBM. If it landed on Sears, they bought Sears. If it landed on Kodak, they bought Kodak. And then they compared the performance of the stocks picked by the monkeys Mm. to the best, smartest experts on Wall Street. And you know what happened? The monkeys won half the time. Are you serious? The monkeys won half the time. Yeah, so anybody who's out here kind of talking about, like, oh, you got to pick this stock at this time, this time, they're kind of making it into, like, a casino and that's not really what the market has to be. Really, if you just spread your money out, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your grandmother probably told you that when you were a baby. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and just buy consistently and, and be patient. Just leave your money there. Let it keep growing. Keep adding money to it. Then eventually your, your wealth will grow. But it doesn't happen overnight. Now, if somebody wants to make fast money sometimes, and, you know, I don't recommend this being your only investment strategy. But I have found that the quickest, easiest way to make a lot of money quickly mm-hmm. is by becoming a really, really good entrepreneur. Like, if you want your family to really have money, then what you do is you shift the culture in your family right now. What do you do? Do not raise your children to believe that the only way they can get money is by going to a job and getting a paycheck. That might be a way to get some money. It, it works sometimes for some people. But there's nobody in America that's more unemployed than black people. So why would you want to depend on corporate America, which has proven itself to be racist time and again, to give you everything you need financially? So what I do with my kid is... I would have my child, you know, learning, reading, writing, math and black history and all the other stuff they need to know. And they can learn how to get a job if they want to. But I'm at the, from a very early age, I'm training them on having their own business. We're talking about this every day. We're going out here hustling, showing ways to get money. Because when you learn how to just go out here and just get money, mm-hmm. then you never feel unemployed. You never feel like you're, you're always just you're down always and out and broke. revenue coming in from somewhere. Yeah, you always figure it out. I mean, and that's that's really the, the new millennial way mm-hmm. to make money. I mean, you know, and, and so to me, like I have to have businesses where I've invested $5,000 and turned it into a quarter million in like oh. a year or two. 
Yeah, I mean, you know what I, you know, and so, so to me, the best decision I ever made in my life was not to go get a PhD. My mm-hmm. PhD paid off. I, I made over a hundred thousand a year. I was doing okay doing that. Mm-hmm. But the best decision I ever made was when I just committed myself to really learning how to be a good entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. When you learn how to do that, man, it's like it's like learning how to be a hunter. You know, if you know how to hunt and you know how to like hungry. get an animal in the woods and cook it and skin it and all that, you never feel like you're gonna starve to death because the restaurants are closed. Mm-hmm. You know how to go get food, exactly. you know, somehow. TheBlackBusinessSchool.com. What are some of the courses and topics that you cover on that website? Well, at, at TheBlackBusinessSchool.com, and this, the, you know, I want to make sure you said the Black yeah. Business. I want to make sure people always know that there's the Black Business School. Uh, we cover a lot of stuff, man. We have classes on um, everything from how to invest in the stock market to how to brand yourself. You know, if you if you're a blogger or a public figure, Damon Dash uh, co co teaches a class with me called Intelligent Boss Moves, mm. where we talk about ways to you know build your independent business like a boss and, and i and i saw dame last week and, and it's like you know dame has a unique personality and, and it's uh it has led to a lot of success i mean he's done some really amazing big things mm-hmm. uh but i think also you supplement that with all the details in the middle mm-hmm. so that people kind of can see it you know because i don't really think you know that people should simply sit back and idolize mm-hmm. what anybody has done him me or your, or your favorite entertainer whoever it is mm-hmm. You know, uh, sit and try to figure out what the game is, figure out how they did it, mm-hmm. and, and, and figure out what your angle is going to be. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and so what what I love about the class I teach with Dame is that it's really it sparked a fire in a lot of young people, especially young brothers or whatever, uh, to help them realize that you know you are meant to be a king. Yeah, and unfortunately, yeah. in this society, uh, the black man is not always positioned to be the king. You know, nobody will invite you into their castle and make you the king. Mm-hmm. They're gonna make you the servant, or they're gonna make you the entertainment. So if you want to be a king and you're a black man, a black man that wants to be a king needs to learn how to build a castle. Exactly. That's, at least that's what I found. You said that. Now, I mean, how do you think that this whole digital age has affected entrepreneurship and economics? Oh, it's blew it out of the water. I mean, it, you know, I'll tell you, if if I'm sending my child to college right now, let's say let's say that um, mm-hmm. my child, the most important thing my child's going to learn before they go to college and while they're in school is how to start a business. Mm-hmm. I'm a, you know, because you got all these little white kids out there in, in Silicon Valley and everything else. They go to college and they start companies that where the companies are worth a hundred million dollars by the time they graduate. Yeah, and it's like a basic idea, like you know, Snapchat. You know, very basic. You know, worth fourteen, ten, twelve billion, or whatever it was. You know, I mean, it's very basic things. And I think that there's nobody more creative than black people. Mm-hmm. You know, we have really just just flipped the world on its head, and everything we do, we always excel. So my argument would be that that for the next generation, the game changer must be that in our culture, we must deeply infuse a commitment to understanding technology at the highest levels and understanding entrepreneurship at the highest levels. And I think that what's going to happen is you're just going to see us just do some amazing things because the Internet really has opened the door of the democratization of media. Now we can talk to each other without a filter. Yeah. So you see the, the best forms of hip hop now rising back to the surface. Exactly. You're seeing, you know, people able to speak to the public that should have been allowed to speak, but had maybe been blackballed, like say Minister Farrakhan. Um, and, and I just see it as, as like a, just a beautiful brand new day. And I know it saved my life, saved my whole career, saved my whole teaching career. You know, because I wanted to teach. But unfortunately, when you talk all this heavy black stuff, you get blackballed. You know, even some HBCUs wouldn't hire me. You know, yeah, yeah, a lot of H- a lot of HBCUs. Because well, the secret that people don't know is that a lot of the certain departments are not don't even have any African American teachers. So you know, you got some Chinese department head who's looking at you like, okay, you're a troublemaker. I don't really want you here. So HBCUs wouldn't even hire me. So what I did was I was like, well, I'm gonna create my own HBCU, mm-hmm. and it was Ooh. beautiful. We have you know thirty thousand students. Um, and uh, and I mean, as far as like income wise, I mean, there's no way. I, I mean, we we I think we grossed over a million dollars last year. So you know, it, it it works better than a teaching job any day of the week. Let's talk about growth from start to where you are now, because see, I know you didn't start with thirty thousand students. Yeah, so know. how was it when you jumped out there with this idea and this bold idea on top of that? Because I mean. This digital age is going crazy now, but it still wasn't booming, and it still really hasn't even uh, reached its peak. But when you started this, like I said earlier, it was the wild, wild west. Yeah, and it still is. Mm -hmm. It still is, but... You know, I'll say when I first started doing a lot of this, it was like maybe 04, 05. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing I did was, uh, back because back then, for example, it wasn't cool to self-publish your own books. Mm-hmm. Uh, I self-published my book. Uh, it was everything you ever want to know about college, and, mm-hmm. and I did it very badly. Um, I did a lot of things very badly in the beginning. You know what I mean? Um, uh, I use, As far as, like, my funding source, didn't nobody give me money or a big break or nothing like that. Yeah. I used money for my paycheck, and I would just, you know, I'd build websites, do all this, that, and the other. I didn't know how to make money. 
I would go, you know, I wanted to give speeches. Nobody would pay me to speak, so I would pay money to get a chance to speak. I would pay money to get a chance to write articles. And what made the difference was, um, uh, you know, a willingness to invest in myself. You know, I like uh, I went to AOL Black Voices and I asked them, I said, well, can I write for you? Because at that time they were the number one black news website online in the country. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they said, well, we don't know if we can afford to pay you because I had a Ph.D. in this, that and the other. I said, look, I'll make it easy. I'll work for free. And they thought I was just going to like throw them an article once every week or two. No, I was writing like eight articles a day. You know, because in my mind, I'm thinking, again, like a business professor, wait a minute, this is the biggest black platform in the country, so I'm reaching all these people for free? Shit, I mean, I'll do this all day. Exactly. You know, so during that time, that's when I built my first following. I built my first little mailing list, maybe 20,000 emails, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I had my own little distribution network mm -hmm. because that's the thing. When I came into media, I came into a thing because I had a lot of media students at mm -hmm. Syracuse, which has a pretty good media school. Mm -hmm. They would come to me and, and want to know, like, because they would start seeing me on CNN or whatnot, and they wanted to know how I did it. And the reason I was able to kind of get ahead of that curve was I thought about the business of media. Mm -hmm. In my mind, fame is man. It's a corporate product. It's manufactured yeah. with, with and the people that got the power, the ones who control the money and the distribution mm -hmm. channels, not the people who actually are on the stage It's those who build the stage and control the stage. They have the power. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was like, well, I don't want to know how to be on the stage. I want to learn how to control the stage. Right. Exactly. So basically, um, I, I went into it. I started thinking about distribution. OK, so I build me a mailing list. I can reach a lot of black people with 20,000, 30,000 at a time. Now we're up to like half a million right mm -hmm. and then social media pops off and i'm like okay how do you how do you master this mm -hmm. and figure okay degrees of separation okay if i know if i reach say fifty thousand intelligent black people and they all reach say a hundred a piece then that's a pretty big number you see what i'm saying that's like what five million right so i start thinking about it like that and so what we did was i realized that you can actually build a distribution channel a distribution network through social media through email through twitter through facebook through all of that right so <laughs> Long story short, uh, that's how we built our network, man. And 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 so to me, I was always a teacher. I was always I was a, bu a businessman and a teacher. As a teacher, I thought of the internet as a giant classroom. Mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? So when I get on my YouTube channel and we got like a hundred, I think we get about three million views a month, something mm -hmm. like that on it now. I every day I go in and I'm like, this is my classroom, man. You know, and I love it because I always felt that the, that the things that I was learning, my people needed this information. And mm -hmm. what got me ahead of other scholars is that they were still thinking that it was 1995. They're still overcommitted to a system that has proven to be racist, dead, antiquated. and antiquated. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, well, okay, y'all, y'all's asses can sit in the back. Y'all y'all just y'all just stay in academia, keep being turtles, keep mm -hmm. keep, you know, keep uh, hoping that mass are gonna hook you up. I'm gonna run over here and see what happens. And it was beautiful because honestly, I didn't have any competition. I'm not the only smart scholar out here, but I was like, yo, I'm if I can't outsmart you, I'm gonna try to out hustle you. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, over time it just kind of built up. Give me that camera, JG. If y'all do not listen to exactly what he just said and follow him step by step, use the damn fool. <laughs> use the damn fool. Okay, now, doctor. Now, I, I, no, because you just gave the whole game to these folks, and the folks don't run with this. They don't have no excuses. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear no excuses after this. Now, uh, you and Dame Dash coming together getting into the films and stuff. How do you feel about getting into the content game? Um, you know what? I've always seen the content game as a part of what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, co creating content is easy uh, in my mind because I don't think of it as something that has to look a certain way all the time. Mm -hmm. It's more about the substance. You know, I've, I've never been a person that's really thought much about Flash. Mm -hmm. I try to think about substance. I, now I try to learn about Flash, but, but substance is, I think, my strength. And so ultimately, you know, to me, content is... Uh, it could be a tweet. It could be a Facebook post. Mm -hmm. It could be a short video. Um, you know, and so what I found out, what I realized was like in Hollywood, they overspend on everything. They spend, you know, they'll spend, you know, $100,000 shooting a three minute scene in a movie, you know, mm -hmm. crazy stuff like that, stuff that don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So what I realized is that there's space for like this whole industry of of good content, good films, good shows that black people want to see where you don't have to go through traditional distribution channels. You ain't got to wait for Lionsgate or Sony to hook you up. Mm -hmm. You can actually, if you got a, you know big enough social media and everything else, you can distribute that way. So exactly. um, so now, it, it, uh, my first foray into that was we started making our own films, like we made Resurrecting Black Wall Street, the mm -hmm. blueprint, to tell the story about the Black Wall Street massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, and that maybe cost, let's say it cost us 25, 20, 25 or less mm -hmm. to make. Uh, but we were able to flip that into, you know, to into our audience and bring back, let's say, 150, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's profitable. It ain't it ain't Paramount Pictures, but 
it works, right? It works. Yeah. So with um, now with Dame and uh, Kanye uh, on the uh, two honorable film, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's a different kind of thing. Dame spent a lot of money making the movie. Mm-hmm. It's a bigger level of investment. Uh, but it's it's a similar idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we could go through the traditional route, but actually I really like going back to my audience. But we also made another film out west called uh, Steel Justice that we just wrapped on. And again, that's more of a, an investment. And so what I wanted to do was really to figure out how to utilize our existing distribution channels, but also to uh, use traditional channels as well. So so I think with Steel Justice, that might go to a, a Sony or a Paramount or somebody like that. Uh, but really, the goal is to sort of flip that money back in mm-hmm. to build the base that black people that, to help build. I can't do it all by myself, yeah. but to be, play a role in sort of helping to build that base mm-hmm. so that it's ours. But, you know, when, when really when, you know, like if somebody said, hey, boys, here's a show on CNN. Mm-hmm. That would be cool, but I wouldn't really feel proud of that because it'd be like, okay, I got here because somebody gave me the hookup. Da, 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 da. Okay, it's nice. You know, but but when you own something, when you create something that's yours, you know, you plant the seed and grow that tree. Idea to conception. Man, it's like it's like the difference between babysitting a child and, and making a baby of your own. It's yeah. not the same. It's a different level. <laughs> exactly. You know? So to me, what 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 the exciting play is, I wanna see um a complete uh, production, distribution, and monetization process for film content that's controlled by black people. Mm-hmm. Well, we can go make the movies. Maybe we can't spend a hundred million mm-hmm. in, in this generation. Now, next generation, our kids are going to take it to the next level if mm-hmm. we teach them the game the right way. But but maybe we, we're spending less than a hundred thousand per film. But then when that film gets done, we make the distribution deals where you go through the digital channels. You got you know millions of loyal black people who again the love who love the community enough to say I want to be a part of this. I'm gonna support this mm-hmm. if it's good. And then also you maybe have a, a chain of black um, venues to watch these films. Now mm-hmm. I call them I would call them black movie theaters, but they wouldn't be movie theaters in the traditional sense. It would be just venues with with lower cost leases mm-hmm. that are comfortable places for people to go watch a movie. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like so to me that's exciting because I could I could see that in my head. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like this year we're gonna make I think uh, about six movies this year. Mm-hmm. Next year we're gonna go for like fifteen to twenty, and uh, and we're just gonna do our best, man. See what we can do with it. Now, for those youngsters and just creatives out there right now, see, the issue that they have, they uh, have no shortage of ideas, okay? And they can create anything from scratch. But crossing that chasm to monetization, that's really where the issues lie. How do you monetize that good idea that you have? Mm. Okay, two things that people got to understand about what you just said. Number uh-huh. one, an idea ain't shit. Mm. An idea is like... It's like it's 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 a figment of your imagination until mm. you make it real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it can be great. It has yeah. potential, but it's nothing when you first have it. And, and anybody who's who you can, that's how you know the difference between somebody who's actually built something mm-hmm. versus somebody who just has an idea. Mm-hmm. People with the idea really think that because that they having the idea is like most of the work. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that ain't that ain't, that, that ain't. that's not even one percent. Of what you got to do, it's like the difference between making a baby and raising a baby to the age of eighteen. Yeah, you know, make you can make a you know that's make, the you, idea, right? It takes one hundred fifty-seven thousand six hundred and eighty dedicated hours exactly. to raise a child to the age of eighteen, but you can make a baby in five, ten, fifteen minutes, exactly. depending on how much time you take in the process, right? So ultimately, I would encourage people to make sure you understand that um, an idea doesn't mean anything until you give until you breathe life into mm-hmm. it, and breathing life requires thousands of dedicated hours. Uh, of your time. So you can have a, a, a thousand different ideas, but there's only going to be maybe four, five, six, seven, ten mm-hmm. that you can raise all the way to fruition. Mm-hmm. Just like you can, you could, a person theoretically, a man could make a thousand babies, mm-hmm. but he can only raise a certain number of children. Yep. You know what I mean? In a proper way, right? So, so when you talk about raising your ideas, make sure you're mature about that. But then also the monetization piece, mm-hmm. what that comes down to is something, the conversation I have with a lot of artists, I have a lot of hip hop artists that'll hit me up. Um, and, and, and I tell them, you know, my theory is that if you're in any kind of entertainment industry, anything, you just spend as much time studying business as you spend studying your art. Mm. You know, like, like, uh, like I, I can think about two young artists that came to me. One of them, I'll say his name. The other one I won't, cause I won't, I don't want to embarrass him, but mm. one of them is D one D one is an artist from the South, very intelligent young guy, man, and, and makes good music doing really well. Uh, when we have conversations we don't talk. I mean, he's in the studio. He's making music like everybody mm-hmm. else, but he wants to know business. We're exactly. talking business. We're talking about distribution, you know, monetization, ticket sales, mm-hmm. marketing, all of that. The other guy makes just as much music as D1, 
but he don't want to do the business part. Mm. You know, I, I I'd be like, hey, well, you know, check out, the, you know, maybe you can check out some of the stuff. Here's some stuff that you know, from that me and Dame were talking about how he built Jay Z up when nobody was listening, checking for Jay Z, and and he does he's not interested in that. Mm. He's interested in the flashy part, being on stage, you know, holding his nuts and all that. And <laughs> it's like, it's like, okay, I mean, you're not learning the whole complete process, mm -hmm. so you're gonna always kind of be beholden to people who understand mm. how this whole machine works. This is a business, and if you don't understand business and you go into this industry. You're probably going to be exploited or neglected or very frustrated. Things will happen that you'll never really understand. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, you'll see a lot of artists that don't understand, like, well, my music's good. Why won't they release it? Or, or I'm really talented. Why can't I get a deal? You know, and it, 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 it's all about knowing how the business is set up. What are some key factors in the business that everybody needs to focus on when they're thinking about cranking up their business? Well, you know, I would say that, you know, that the, the power, first of all, the power uh, typically is held by the person that can get the money, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, if you have some ability to get access to capital on some level, that gives you strength. Also, there's ways to um, to build uh, to build a brand or to build a you know distribution channel to build the business, uh, you know, by scaling down based on what you got, right? Um, so, you know, when I start a new business, I don't go out and I and drop eighty thousand dollars trying to make it go. I might put um, two hundred dollars or five hundred dollars. And just see if I even have a market. I test the market out. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and then if it works, if if it works the same way you could take a million and turn it into two million, it, you should be able to take ten dollars and turn it into twenty dollars, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, and that's what tells you if you got something, right? And so, so I would say that you know, just kind of seeing everything, seeing all of entertainment as production, distribution, monetization, really goes a long way. What's production? Production is just the creation of whatever you're gonna make your album, your film, whatever. The distribution is getting it in front of people. You know, how do you get it out there, right, To in front of eyeballs? Monetization is how do you turn fame into fortune, right? People talk about, you know, people being rich and famous. Mm -hmm. But, no, they don't always go together. There's a lot of people who are famous that are not rich. Broke. And it comes down to the ability to take that visibility mm -hmm. and, it, and get the consumer to engage or to get something to happen mm -hmm. that will allow you to monetize that. So whenever we put out a film or anything, we're always thinking, okay, what's the best monetization method? Do we let people in for free and make our money on the merch? Do we do we bundle the products a certain way? Do we charge for this and not charge for that? Do we put, you know, do we get them to pay for this person and then tack this other thing onto mm -hmm. that? You see what I mean? And the business people kind of know all of this because a lot of times it's about how you skin the cat to, that, that really makes a difference in whether or not you're going to get access to what you're looking for. Now, when you're thinking about the monetization part, do you think you should go corporate or go direct to consumer? Um, you know what? I think it depends on what your opportunities are and how it works. Um, I had a conversation with an artist about that one time where he had already established the ability to sell, let's say, um, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of albums mm -hmm. on his own. And he got offered a record deal. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, so you got to ask yourself, what's the value added on this deal that they're offering you? Um, you know, uh, you don't want to get a corporate deal just because, see, sometimes we feel better. Like if we're signed, because corporate <laughs> America kind of legitimizes us. It's like, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm with cash money. Or I'm with so-and-so. -so. so you start to feel like, like these labels mm -hmm. kind of like, and I think black people, unfortunately, we we're more susceptible to that because we need labels to feel validated, yeah. you know, and I'm, I don't think that's healthy, but we do that sometimes. Um, uh, but truth is like, um, you know, there are some situations where, what the corporation is going to do for you is something you could already do yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, you may be giving them more than they're giving you. So, for example, I had a radio network offer me the chance to uh, to do a show. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, well, I can already do a show online myself and reach a lot of people. Like, what are you adding? And they were like, well, you know, we, we, we can't pay you that much. Or the amount they were going to pay me was minim minimal. And the market wasn't that great. And I said, OK, so what you're doing is you're telling me you're going to eat up a lot of my time utilize my audience not compensate me and you know and, and i don't really feel like i'm really getting anything from this right now if they come up and say well you got the network and the distribution we're gonna come up with some money mm -hmm. because you already a proven commodity you're not a nobody that has nothing and that would make more sense you see what i mean so i think it's a matter of figuring out you know where you're at like so for example if i have no platform <laughs> then maybe corporate's better because they can give you that platform yeah um but but if i've already got a platform that's working pretty well like if i'm a guy like uh prince e prince e mm -hmm. i don't know if you've seen prince e mm -hmm. this dude puts out videos and gets you know 30 million views you know and and, and whatever you know yeah. he's already touring around the world just off of that mm -hmm. that i don't really see how a corporation unless a corporation was really advanced in their thinking could really offer a deal to him that would even entice him if, if he's monetizing that even, you know, at a minimal level. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, lastly, Doctor, the All Black National Convention. Hit that one more time, man. Yes, the All Black National Convention. We are going to get together. And we're going to talk about all the issues that Black people need to talk about. Uh, we're also going to show three films. We're going to show Hidden Colors Four, Resurrecting Black Wall Street, and the uh, third film is a uh, Generation One. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, how to establish generational legacies in your family. Uh, as it pertains to wealth. A lot of people don't know, for example, that 70% of wealthy families lose all their money within one generation, Mm. right? So (laughs) that's because you're not teaching your children everything you figured out in your hustle. So we're going to be there for three days in Atlanta. Give me a couple of those little nuggets that we got to teach these kids so they'll know what they're looking for. A couple of things that kids need to learn in order to uh, make sure they can uh, build wealth Mm. and take care of the wealth they're given Mm -hmm. Uh, number one, uh, knowledge. Uh, every black child in America should learn the fundamentals of entrepreneurship at a very early age. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they, they should never be taught that they can only get a job. They should be taught how to create a job. Uh, the second is uh, investment. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if you invest $100 a month to, for your child from the time they're born, by the time they're 30 to 40 years old, they'll have somewhere close to a million dollars. Uh, the third component is uh, discipline. It's actually KID. That's the model I use. Uh, kid, so people can remember it. Discipline is the ability to delay gratification. Mm -hmm. They've shown that Mm -hmm. children who can delay gratification at an early age are more successful than other people uh, 30, 40 years down the line. And so long story short, you know, I would say that, um, you know, the kids are, that's the key. I mean, you know, we have a, actually have a wealth building program for children at blackmillionairesoftomorrow.com that people can sign up for. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really popular. And basically what we train our kids to do will create what I call the economic soldiers for the next generation. If we could train fifty to 100,000 black children mm-hmm. on the fundamentals of wealth building, entrepreneurship, and cooperative economics, that first 50,000 will employ the next 50 million. That's going to be the game changer. That, that will make us the envy of every other community out here. So that's what we focus on, man. So the All Black National Convention, uh, which at allblacknationalconvention.com is where people can buy tickets. Mm-hmm. We also have a live stream, uh, which you can find at drboycelivestream.com. Uh, that's drboycelivestream.com. Where basically, if you live somewhere else and you, or you can't make it, you can actually watch the live stream. Uh, we're going to be there for three days. We're going to have panels on police brutality, wealth building, uh, strengthening the black man, strengthening the black woman, uh, another panel on the educational system, and a, and a bunch of other things. And uh, we got a lot of cool people. David Banner's coming out. Uh, Killer Michael be there. George Olu Stevens, Dr. Tyra Selden, Dr. Roosevelt Mitchell the Third, Yurima Karama. The list goes on and on. So it's going to be besides amazing. Atlanta, where else? Uh, what other cities will you be hitting? Uh, you know what? We're not taking this anywhere else. What? Yeah, yeah. This is this is a convention. Uh, right now, Ooh, the plan is for I us see to do what's it one going time. on here. Yes, uh-huh. we gonna this do gonna it be one a time by the end of it. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. We we gonna do it one time right mm-hmm. here. Now I do have other events. Dr. Claude Anderson and I, uh, the author of Powernomics, we doing an event in D.C. in October, mm-hmm. and I and I'm going to different cities doing you know doing my thing. But mm-hmm. this is the only time where we're really actually putting out pulling out all the guns mm-hmm. and bringing everybody together to really do something special. Malik Shabazz is going you know just really just eclectic groups of black people. And the number one thing I want is, I, I just said, well, I told them what I don't want. I don't want the paid off Negroes to be there. I don't want the people that are too institutionalized that they've, yeah. that they've really lost touch of what reality is and what the mm-hmm. truth is in terms of what we're facing as black people. I want truth tellers there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be awesome. Zaza Ali's coming. I mean, a lot of people will be there. It's going to be great. Doctor, thank you so much for coming through this thing, sir. Thank you, my brother. Thank yes, you. Sir. Behind. It's Hot 107.9, man. Let's go.